Pray with me. Lord, we give you thanks for this morning. We give you thanks for this opportunity uh, to gather together around your word. And Lord, we invite you to be present here among us. Uh, We invite you to open our hearts and our minds. Help us, Lord, to uh, be able to to look within, uh, to see what it is that you might be saying to each one of us, uh, ways that we need uh, to move closer to you. And Lord, help us to do that. Help us to trust in you through the storm. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking our pastor is a scheduling genius. What better way to welcome new members into our congregation than with a good sermon on lust? Yeah, that was well planned. But I think this is an important topic. I think to to some extent, uh, this week and probably next week are the, the two of these deadly sins that have, uh, have visited the most damage on Christian lives. They're things that whether we want to admit it or not, we all struggle with to some extent or another. And it's really no wonder, when it comes to, to lust, for instance, we are constantly, at least in our culture today, we are constantly bombarded with messages. With messages that say, if you buy our products, you will attract the attention of whatever you desire or whoever you desire. You see, we have bought in, because to some extent it is actually true, to the belief that sex sells. Because it does. That's why they keep using it. Because it makes people money. But it's an important concept, especially for if you, if you look at the history of the church, it is perhaps lust more than anything else that has led to the downfall of many Christian leaders and many Christian people. It's a difficult topic to talk about. This was not one of my favorite sermons to prepare for. But there it is. And it's interesting, if we look at the scripture that I chose for our preparation for worship. It tells us in Romans chapter 1, starting at verse 24, Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity. So here, this is, this is suggesting that that God has given these people that are being talked about uh, here over to their lust. But why would God do that? Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Now, I think we probably could all agree that culturally, in our current society, this passage is very true. For for the most part, culturally, we have given up the truth about God for a lie. And one of the ways that that tends to work out in a society is the decay of morals and ethics. But this isn't just a cultural problem. It is an individual problem. And today I want to look at a story that 
may be familiar to many of us, but I think shows us how uh, this particular sin can work its way into our lives. We're in 2 Samuel chapter 11. And that chapter begins in the spring of the year. Now, we all know what springtime brings. We, we've just been through the harshness of winter and springtime, the, the flowers and the grass and the green begin to bud and, and it gives hope and life to our very souls. So in the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, now in this time period in Israel, winter is the rainy season. And so it, it's wet and, and muddy, but in the springtime, things dry up a bit and it's, it's easier to, to transport your troops uh, across the ground and to, to engage in battle. So uh, having been somewhat dormant for the winter, the springtime was the time when kings led their forces out into battle. But then it goes on to say, David sent Joab, that was his general. David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. Now we're going to stop there for a minute because this is the setup. Immediately, right here in the first paragraph, we are told that there, there's a problem. Something is not quite right because it's springtime and it is the time when kings lead their forces out into battle. But David who is at this point the king, sent. David did not go. David sent Joab and his officers and all of Israel out to do battle. But he stayed at home. Now, why would David stay at home? Why would he not lead his forces into battle. In fact, if you go back into 1 Samuel, when the people of Israel first come to Samuel and say, we want a king. I mean, this whole, you know, following God and being a theocracy and and having judges that are raised up when we're in trouble to to lead us, that's very nice. But, But we want to be like all the other nations. We want a king. And one of the reasons that they state that they want a king is We want a king to rule over us and to lead us into battle, to fight our battles for us. And they go through Saul, who was every bit what one would think of as a king, but he failed God, and God chose David. And from that point on, David has been very successful. I mean, David is truly a rags-to-riches story. David was the youngest of all his brothers. He wasn't much to look at, apparently. He was a shepherd when Samuel found him. And now he is the king of all Israel. And he has been very successful as king. They have extended their their borders. He has built a a beautiful palace. He wanted to build a temple for, for God. But God said, leave that for your son. But he's been very successful. So why? Why does he stay at home and send his troops into battle? And I love the way that verse 2 starts. It happened. Well, yes, it did. 
It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house. Now, to be honest, this is not necessarily unusual. I, I, a lot of times, with, especially with a palace, I mean, in today's world, in, in big cities, you have a, a big building, you have a penthouse at the top, and sometimes on the roof, uh, they will have, you know, sort of a garden patio area. Well, that's uh, on the roof of this palace uh, was a living space, an outdoor living space, uh, probably with a little tent that would keep you from the rays of the sun. And that may actually have been where this couch was that David was napping upon. Now, see, there's another clue. David has sent his his general and his officers and all of Israel out to fight the battle. Now, you could say in your mind, well, maybe he had important things to do back at the palace. Maybe he had paperwork to fill out or, or who knows what, but it appears David's bored. He's napping in the afternoon on his couch and then wandering about on his roof. That says to me, I mean, I've been there. He's bored. He's not sure what to do with himself. And I suspect that having, having had all of this success, David had, has reached that point. We in our modern terminology often call it a midlife crisis, but he's reached that point where he's thinking, okay, this is great. I've, I've, had, I've had all sorts of success. I have this great palace. But is, is that all there is? What can I do with myself now? I mean, I fought battles. I, I don't know that I really want to go out and fight another battle. I have people to do that for me. So, so he stays home. But he really doesn't have, have a clue. He, he doesn't have an idea. He doesn't, he doesn't have something to to focus his attention on. And here he is in a place that he's not supposed to be doing stuff he shouldn't be doing because he should be out with his troops. And he's not sure what to do with himself. He's looking for something to, to put a spark back in his life, to to add a little excitement to the everyday routine. And so, here he is, wandering aimlessly on the roof of his house. And while he's wandering, he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. So David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, and wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her. And she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period, and then she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So here's David trying to, to figure out his life, not sure what to do with himself. He's not out where, with his troops where he's supposed to be. He's back at home. He's not really filling his days with anything meaningful, apparently. But this is David. This is David who took on the giant Goliath because he believed that God would deliver them from this giant. He went out onto the battlefield with a giant with no armor, just a sling and a few stones. 
This is David who wrote many of the Psalms in our book of Psalms. This is David who, if he is struggling, if, if he's wondering what's next for my life, what is my next calling, what, what's the next thing for me to, to accomplish or to do, you would expect David to cry out to God. Okay, God, we've done well so far. What, what's next? You'd expect him to, to seek God's direction. But you might notice that God is not mentioned in this passage. There's nothing about God. It's just David struggling with life issues, but trying to work it out on his own. And strangely enough, an opportunity presents itself. Now, I went to a Promise Keepers event a number of years ago, and this was the passage that one of the speakers spoke on, and, and he was sort of hammering the idea that David was somewhere that he should not have been. But being there and looking out over the city and having to catch a glimpse of this woman bathing, he made the point that, okay, perhaps it started innocently. Perhaps he was just surveying all of his kingdom and he just happened to notice this woman. But it's at that point that David should have gotten off the roof. He should have gone somewhere else. But he didn't. He lingered. He watched. And that was sort of the theme which a few of us who were there together have, have kind of kept over the years. Get off the roof. But David didn't. He didn't get off the roof. And he sends, he sends somebody else to find out who this woman is. And they come back with the information of who her father is and who her husband is. And so he has that information. He knows that this is a married woman, but he sends for her. Now, some have wondered, was this just a random occurrence? Or did Bathsheba know that the king had stayed back? Was she bathing within his view intentionally? It really doesn't matter. Because David was the king. In our current terminology of sexual harassment, David is totally in the wrong. He is the person in the power position. He is the one who could have stopped this before it ever got started. But he doesn't. But here's the other thing that I want you to notice. There is no relationship here. David doesn't know who this woman is. He has to ask who this woman is. Now certainly she would know who David was, but he sends for her and she comes and they sleep together and he sends her home. There is no relationship. There is just lust. You see, that's really one of the issues in our culture today is that there, there is no understanding of the difference between love and lust. We are, are bombarded with images and with messages 
all the time that equate sex and love as if they are the same. They are not the same. I've heard people say to me, people should be able to love whoever they want. And I totally agree. We are called to love everyone. That doesn't mean that we are called to have sex with everyone. They are different. Now, one of the problems is that in the English language, we have the one word, love. And so, according to our language, I feel the same way about my wife and my children as I do about cheesesteaks, my New Balance sneakers, any number of things, because I love them all. But does that mean that I feel the same about my family as I do about my sneakers? I hope not. Now, in the Greek language, there are multiple words. We live in the, well, in the greater Philadelphia area, and the, the word Philadelphia comes from phileo, brotherly love, familial love. That's the love where you're related to somebody, and even though they annoy you sometimes, they're family. And so we love them anyway. The Bible usually uses agape, which is unconditional love. That's the love which 1 Corinthians chapter 13 talks about. Love is patient, love is kind. That's agape love. That's the kind of love that we should have for one another and for everyone. That's, that's the love that reaches out and cares and takes care of, puts the other person first. And then there's eros, romantic love. It's where we get words like erotic. But even that is a step up from lust. Eros is, is romantic love, but still, even though that's a more physical love, it's, it's something that that sets the object of that love on a pedestal, that per puts the object first. See, that's really the difference between lust and love. Love is focused on the other person. Lust is all about me, my needs my satisfaction, my desires. You see, in this story with David, Bathsheba doesn't really matter. I mean, that's a terrible thing to say, but from David's perspective, it's a lust. He wants to satisfy an itch, and she just happens to be convenient. But he satisfies that itch and and sends her home. And there's no suggestion at that point that there will be any ongoing relationship. There's no suggestion that it will go any farther than that one afternoon. Except she becomes pregnant. Her husband is off with the rest of Israel in battle where David should have been. So he can't be blamed. How are they going to explain this? And so David's loss then leads to other poor choices, to other bad decisions. Oh, well, I'll, I'll call her husband home from the front. He'll come and then he can sleep with her and they'll, everybody will think it's his. But it turns out, Uriah is what we'd call a stand-up guy. 
He comes back because the king has ordered him. But his men are still out on the battlefield. He's not going to come home and enjoy the luxuries of home as David has been doing while his men are still out on the battlefield. And so David is stuck. And so he... And this is villainous brilliance right here. He sends Uriah back into battle with a written note to Joab the general. Uriah carries his own execution papers to the general that orders Joab to put Uriah right on the front lines where the fighting is the harshest, assuring that he will be killed in battle. But hey, he was killed in battle. David didn't lay a hand on him. And it all started because David stayed home. You see, and that's the problem. You know, we, we like to point fingers at people like David because it's an obvious story. We, we read the story and I don't think there's anybody in the world who would say, he did a good job there. It's terrible. But it didn't start with an intention. David just made small decisions along the way. I'm going to let Joab handle this battle. I'm just going to stay home. I'm just going to wander on my roof, check out the city, see what's happening when none of the men are around. And it's just one small decision after another that leads to some huge and terrible decisions. And it could have been avoided if David had done what he'd done in the past and sought God's direction from the beginning. You see, lust is one of those things that we don't necessarily see coming. It just happens. But because of that, we need to be prepared ahead of time. We need to know if this sort of situation occurs, how do I handle that? We need to be clear in our heads what we are willing and aren't willing to do. But the fact is that passion often overrides all of those good intentions. That's why we need God. That's why we need to be in constant communication with God. Starting our day saying, I have no idea, God, what I'm going to encounter today. And I don't know if I'll be able to handle much of what I encounter today. So I'm going to need you. I'm going to need you to give me the strength and the wisdom to handle whatever comes. Because I know in and of myself, I'm probably not going to make the best choices. See, that's kind of the point of the gospel, is that we can't handle these things on our own. And God has stepped in to forgive us for those things that we have already messed up. But he also offers himself that, that we might ask him for his help, that we might allow him to, to guide us, to steer us, to direct us. 
Because remember, Jesus is not just our Savior. He's our Lord and Savior. That Lord, that means he's in charge. He's the director of our lives. But we need to give him that opportunity to actually do it. We need to trust in him. Because as we started with, one of the reasons, and I think David is a good example, David did not come to God. Perhaps he had gotten to a place in his success where he believed he could handle things. He could do it on his own. That's believing a lie. And so when we do that, God has a tendency to say, all right, let's see how you do. David didn't do very well. And there are many others who haven't done well either. But the good news here is that God is a God of grace and mercy. So that even when we, we stray and we make mistakes and we fall, we can be forgiven. This is a terrible chapter in David's life. He makes mistake after mistake, bad choice after bad choice. And he pays the consequences. Starting with this incident, his family falls apart. And it begins with a rape. One of his sons raping one of his daughters, two different mothers. But moral choices. But still, David is restored. David is still known as a man after God's own heart. Jesus, our Savior, is known at least sometimes as son of David. Because when, when David was faced with what he had done, he repented. Now, it did have to be brought to his attention. And I have to say, Nathan had a lot of guts to stand up and accuse David. Because one of the definite possibilities is David just has him executed and goes on with his life. But he didn't. He took the criticism. He recognized his fault. He repented. And he turned back to God. He still had to deal with some nasty consequences, but he was able to restore his relationship with his God. Friends, sin is, is not a good thing, but it isn't the end. Sin damages us in many ways, but it also provides us an opportunity to come before God, to confess our sin, and to receive his forgiveness. So I pray that we might try to live in God's word, to ask him for help even before we need it, and to follow him as best we can. But when we make mistakes, when we go off on our own, that we, would, that we would turn around, that we would turn back to him, that we would trust him to forgive us, that we might be restored. And 
that we would do it all in the mighty name of our Savior and our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen.